Microsoft Office is here, but will it make you switch from Google productivity apps? Plus, the Apple Watch saves lives and gets you a free phone and an internship. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 429 for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. With one simple integration, you can offer your customers every way to pay. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee free, go to braintreepayments.com slash tech night. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to the tech news. Joining me today is Allison Sheridan, longtime Mac geek and host of NoSillaCast. Welcome to the show, Allison. Hey, Megan, this is going to be fun. I think so, too. Uh, are I'm you ready to talk about some news? Let's do it. Now, I know you're an Apple expert, so I thought we'd do the non-Apple news first. Uh, the new Microsoft Office is out today. You can now share, collaborate, and finally, they've added real-time co-authoring for Microsoft Word. Uh, what do you think? Are you an Office user or you, do you use Google Apps or something I was else? I was an Office user. I sort of use one of each thing. I'm, a, I'm an Excel user, but a Keynote user and then a, a Google Docs user. I, I get it all mixed up. But I'm really confused by this announcement because I thought they said that um, the, the Mac version 2016 was finally up on par with the Windows version. And it was already at 2016 a little while ago. So their, their, their naming convention, shockingly, is weird. Well, I think there's a lot of confusing stuff about it, not just the naming, but the pricing structure. You know, you no longer go out. It's a subscription service, I guess. And now it's a little bit, costs a little bit more, They like 5% to 7% more. Mm. Um, so I'm not really sure. Uh, I guess it's a subscription and you keep paying for it and you get the new version. I think that's but they did. They did also announce now, at least for Windows, that you can buy it standalone. And I think that might have been a big deal today. And I don't know that the 2016 for the Mac is out yet as a standalone. Well, it's interesting because I mean, they've done so much with apps. Um, you know, I use Outlook on my phone, on my you know, iPhone. Uh, they really have started building some excellent apps for iOS. Uh, and I think that'll be yeah, really exciting. Yeah. I know I promised to do the Apple News next, but it'll be exciting <laughs> when we get the iPad Pro and to see how those apps work on that. I do have to say it was really funny. My daughter sent me an email and it said, sent to you from Outlook. And I wrote to her, I was like, what? You're using Outlook? And she said, oh, mom, I didn't want you to find out this way. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Uh, so they also announced something called Gig Jam, which they had announced earlier uh, before, and it's not going to be available until next year, but it sort of sounds like Slack or Trello or HipChat. It certainly has a name like that. Uh, so it sounds like they're really trying to get in on that. We're cool. You know, we know how offices work and startups work in this new way. Uh, apparently, you can use Cortana to call up business data from sources like Salesforce, Outlook, Microsoft Office 365, and LinkedIn. So it doesn't, I mean, it does something very different than Slack, but uh, what do you think mm -hmm. about Gig Jam? Is that something well, that'll be useful to you? Don't they also have Skype? <laughs> I mean, isn't it, is it an, just another chat app, but it's got more interaction? I think it's sort of collecting from all these different sources. I mean, it's just very, it's very enterprise-ish. And yes, they have Skype and Skype for Business, which they uh, told us several times yesterday as Skype was down, this doesn't affect Skype for Business. Skype for Business is okay. <laughs> it's only the free version. So yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what it is, um, but it looks like it could be interesting. Yeah, I, I don't actually work in enterprise anymore, but it used to be something I cared about a lot. And and communications is the single hardest thing when you're in a big company, man. It's it's so much goes wrong that if you could just talk to each other better. It's so true. And yeah, I mean, I, I've sort of given up on email. It's really <laughs> difficult to use for work or personal stuff too. I mean, I, I take all conversations, um, try to move them to text messaging. That seems to be the way that uh, is easier for me. So I don't, I don't know if I would use something like this if we used it at work. We're, we're, we use a combination of Google here and, uh, and HipChat too. Right, right. So Ahmed Mohammed, the boy who was arrested for bringing a homemade clock to school, uh, he was seen on Twitter today hanging out with Sergey Brin at the Google Science Fair. Uh, this was a cool story. Um, what did you think? Have you been following this story? 
Yeah, yeah. It's such a horrible, horrible, awful thing has turned into the best thing ever for him, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it will be a something burned into his memory for the rest of his life, but it sure has been an advantage for him now. Yeah, I mean, I think The Verge called it like his, he was doing his like nerd victory tour, which I think was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, totally deserved. All Some people, of course, are saying, you know, it's been overblown. He's getting too much credit, you know, uh, bringing up the you know, what's dangerous to, you know, that he brought this thing that looked like a bomb to school and that was dangerous. But I, I still think that the people, the only people who overreacted at this point were the, were the school and I right. do believe, I'm not the first person to say this, that it's it's not the school or the teachers are not the first people to blame, but just in general, this culture of fear that we've created. Right, fear and by the color of his skin and what his name was, all those things combined have sure turned into a mess. Uh, but what I, what I do like, even though it's probably overblown for him and he's probably getting too much credit because it was just a clock, but maybe he's done going to do some other great things. I hope so. Um, but what's being celebrated and talked about and talked about and talked about is that you should be a little nerdlet and and do these things. You should try to build stuff. You know, and it that it it's adding to the culture of coolness. And and I know I'm speaking to all other geeks, but we're inheriting the earth right now, and it's awesome. And that is <laughs> that is a great way to put it. I totally agree. Yes, I mean just to be celebrated for your curiosity and for your interest in in wanting to make things and wanting to bring them into school and show your teacher because you're so excited. I think. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And the news today was that he's actually pulling out of the school district. I think his family is uh, going to take a tour. They're going to see the White House and probably accept a lot of the other big invitations that that they've been made. And it's it, I thought that was interesting because it does seem like for a lot of people, the traditional school system isn't really working. And, uh, you know, a lot of geeks are trying to, you know, hack schools and create new schools or homeschool. And, um, you know, I just wish that we could do better in the schools because not everybody can you know, pull their kids out of school and travel to the White House. Yeah, it seems like you really need to feed the nerds. You know, you, you, need, to, you need to feed them and give them more and more interesting things to do or they're going to go off and do these, these things that, that might be destructive, even though, you know, not everybody's going to end up being a Wozniak. But <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So Android police spotted some text in a recent update that referred to a product called YouTube Red. They suspect that this is the name for the Google Music Key subscription service. So the service is out there. Maybe it'll be changed to Google Red. If it is, you will be the first to know. And coming up, we will cover reviews of the new iPhones, an explanation of Xcode Ghost, and other Apple news of the day. But first, this episode is brought to you by Braintree, code for easy online payments. If you're a mobile app developer, check out Braintree. They have excellent customer service, simple integration, and they'll get you ready to receive payments quickly. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution, support for all payment types your customers might want, so you can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and more, all with a single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash tech night. So now on to the Apple news. The first round of hands-on reviews of the iPhone 6S and the 6S Plus are out. Christina Warren from Mashable calls the new 3D touch and live photo features truly innovative. And Joanna Stern from the Wall Street Journal says it doesn't do a great job that the iPhone 6S, both of them don't do a great job of fixing many of the problems that she currently has with the iPhone 6. She says battery life is worse and they continue to rip off customers by offering a base model of 16 gigabytes for $649 without a payment plan or contract. Uh, are you gonna get one of the S model phones, Allison? Actually, my husband and I do the tick and the talk, and that way we both, at all times, there's one of the new phones in the house to test and play with and mess around with. And I was I was really surprised at how well this, this peak and pop stuff with the 3D touch is supposed to be working. Um, it sure looked confusing to me, but I think part of it is that we couldn't feel the, the haptic feedback when we were watching the demo. So it sounds like uh, the, the reports I've heard is that that's been pretty good. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see how that works and the, and the live photos as well. Those should be fun. But I, I thought the coverage was kind of funny of the, uh, the early reviews. Shockingly, some people liked it and some people didn't. <laughs> right, I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then there's the, you know, it's the best phone yet. And it's like, well, we would hope it's the best phone yet. <laughs> Otherwise, why would we buy it? So that that's yeah. interesting, though. So you haven't drunk the Kool-Aid of you need a new iPhone every year yet. 
No, I, I I buy enough Apple stuff as it is. Um, I, I I got called by my credit card company a little while ago saying that there was unusual activity and there was a charge to Apple. And I said, I said, you know, honey, the month you see me without an Apple charge, that's when you know my car's been hacked. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, iPad Pro, I think, just because that's different enough that it's going to be something crazy fun to have. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. So the rose gold isn't swaying you either? No, no, I'm I'm sort of a space gray girl myself. <laughs> oh, so you so you have the six? Uh, yeah, I have the I have the six, and then uh, I have the MacBook in space gray. So you know, you need the you need the suite of products in the same color. You can't be mixing it up. No, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, there's some. New, I mean, there's the features everyone's been talking about. The you know, Force Touch um, or 3D Touch, I guess it's called. Uh, then there's like the new selfie flash that like this, the entire screen blinks yeah. white when you take selfies in low light. I think it'll be interesting. It's it's always interesting when they release iOS, the new iOS and the phone at the same time. It's I think it's confusing to the average person. What do I get from iOS 9 and what do I get from actually having to go out and buy the new hardware? Right, right. I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I've been watching the stories that iOS 9 has taken off like crazy. What they say, Apple announced 50% of the phones capable of iOS 9 are already on it. Um, but when I sit down to try to think about, hey, what's cool about iOS 9? I say, oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> There's search in, in system pre in the preferences, I think. And uh, let's see, I like the way the little cards flip, but you know, it just doesn't jump out as you're going to die if you don't get it. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's interesting to me. You know, my kids have iPads through the school. They have the one-to-one -one iPads that just started this year. And, you know, they came, they mm. came on, the, they said, well, the school hasn't decided if we're allowed to download iOS 9 or not. And <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> it's just fascinating because those were not issues that I dealt with in school at all. Yeah, really. It's don't draw in your in your book. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Remember books? Yeah. And those, I mean, those iPads that they give to students, are, they don't even look like iPads. They're covered in the most, you know, the craziest rubber case. They can barely even touch them. It's, um, oh, but, really? Yeah. But I'm glad. It's, it's got this much space left for glass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So TechDirt is reporting that people are not happy about a Wired.com article that appeared first on the new Apple News app yesterday, and people couldn't even read it if they didn't have Apple News until today. Uh, so, you know, they posted it on Facebook. There were a lot of angry comments. Uh, what do you think about this, uh, this articles coming out on Apple News only at first? I guess I don't see why people are so angry about it. I mean, that's just a business deal, right? I mean, why, why couldn't they do that? I'm I'm kind of liking that that the news app itself. I find it pleasing, especially if Wired does it, because Wired drives me out of my mind on my iPad with the pop-up ads, and you can't even get to the little X to to close it. It just oh, it's a horrible experience. Um, having something exclusive, that's just that's just business, right? Why the why the big wee about it? I know, and I'm sure people just heard about the story and went to it for that reason and said, oh, we can't get it. You know, it's just haters gonna hate, yeah. right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so yesterday, a Cape Cod teenager told his local news station that his Apple Watch saved his life. And now 9 to 5 Max says that Tim Cook has called the boy, offered him an internship, and given him a new iPhone. Uh, this is a great story. I mean, I don't, I don't, I love my Apple Watch, and I definitely use the heart rate monitor. But the way this story was told, that he, he claimed the only reason that he knew that everything in his body was failing was that his heart rate stayed at 145 after practice. Yeah, well, he actually uh, laid down and took a nap and checked it again. And when it said 145 after a nap, he thought, yeah, this just doesn't sound right. So, you know, how many times have you felt just really crappy, but then you go, you know, check with the thermometer and you notice, no, it's 98.6. You say, ah, I'm probably fine. So having that available to him right there where he didn't have to do any work, that he was able to still be lying down and, and tap it, uh, was pretty cool. I don't quite understand why the internship. It's not like the, like our friend Ahmed that we were just talking about where he showed some cleverness. This guy was playing football. You know, <laughs> I mean, he might be brilliant. It, don't get me wrong. I, I don't know anything else about the guy, but it's not like any part of the story made me think, wow, I need that guy on my team. Well, right. that team, I the mean, technical if, team. <laughs> if I said, you know, it saved my life because I didn't have to pick up my iPhone, you know, when I was driving and it tapped my wrist to tell me to turn left, like, do you think he would give me an iPhone or internship? I don't know. 
They should. <laughs> they they <laughs> really, he really should. It is, it is an interesting, those two stories, it's interesting that you bring that other one up because it does seem like there are, uh, you know, once someone gets some traction on Twitter, an unknown person gets some traction on, on social media, then, you know, it, I think that public leaders have, you know, realized that they could also, you know, benefit from, from that by reaching out to them on Twitter. It's one of those things on Twitter, it's like very easy to reach out. Like Obama, it was very easy for him to reach out and to not only reach out, but to have the rest of us see him reaching out. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's good PR. <laughs> exactly. So yesterday, Apple released a statement to Reuters saying that they were up, that they were, that on the App Store, they were removing malicious iPhone and iPad programs. Uh, the malware is codenamed Xcode Ghost. From what I read at first, it didn't seem like it was that much of a danger to people, especially in the United States or, you know, it, in people not in China. But now I'm not so sure. Can you explain a little bit about what's going on here? Yeah. So when you develop an application for iOS, you use an app or for the Mac, you use a tool called Xcode and it's a development environment where you build your, your app. Uh, it's a huge application. It's I want to say it's around three gig. It's just giant. It takes forever to download. So evidently, these uh, people in China that are doing development, it was very slow to download. So someone offered them, hey, here's a version locally. And it turned out that the they had been injected malware into the Xcode environment itself. So this wasn't the real version of Xcode. They'd taken it down, reassembled it with some, some uh, malware in it. And the result was that the applications they developed were uh, now had malware in them. So there's really a couple of interesting things there. The, the fact that these companies used Xcode from the wrong source is kind of an interesting bit. The fact that when they were injected with malware, the Apple processes didn't fix it. So, uh, you know, a, a Apple fanboys like myself love to march around going, aha, Android, you know, you're all full of, ma yeah, shut up. You can't say that. You, you just got to not talk like that because it's going to bite you with something like this. Um, the thing that got even more interesting was the number of apps. I mean, I think it was around 30 or, or 40 a couple of days ago, and it's been growing. I, I want to say it was more than 100 now. Um, and, and so they're, what they said specifically was they're pulling the apps that they know have the problem. And they didn't necessarily say, we have caught all of the apps yet. But the last piece that got very interesting was uh, one, of the, one of the companies that had the malware in their app was Rovio, makers of Angry Birds. So Angry Birds 2 in China had the malware injected into it. And I, and I started thinking about what does that actually mean? Because I, I understand that there's separate stores. There's a Chinese store and there's a Ch an Irish store and there's an American store, uh, a U.S. store. But they're... Um, they must redevelop to do the language localizations, I'm guessing. So there's a version of, of Angry Birds 2 in the U.S. store apparently does not have the problem, but the one in the Chinese Apple store does. So there's a lot of different pieces to this, and it's, it's definitely not good for Apple. And they're, uh, they're working hard to make this not happen again. So the headline says they pulled the apps from the App Store. But what you're saying is that really what happened is they pulled the apps that they know are infected, but there could be a lot more and we really don't know. Yeah, it, it didn't sound as de definitive. We caught all of the apps. They, you know, just the, you watch the wording that the lawyers let them put in their, in their letter that just sounded a little bit short of everything. Uh, and the fact that the numbers have been going up over time just gives you a little queasy feeling. But it does appear to be from the Chinese app store. So I don't think you should lose a lot of sleep here, but you should hope that Apple gets beaten for this one. And, and as much as we beat Google for theirs. Right. And so do we know specifically what could have, like what the malware does? No, Apple is saying right now that they have not seen any malicious behavior from those apps yet. So they don't know of any examples of, say, private data being shipped off to somebody else. So they aren't saying that they've seen any problems from it yet. So maybe we'll get lucky. But if you've already got the infected app, when the app developers, uh, Apple's working with the app developers to get good versions of their of their apps up there, then the, the updates would automatically get pushed to you and you'd be okay. Um, but they need to publish the list of apps, which they haven't done yet. I think they said they're about to soon so that you'll know, you know, don't touch that app for a little while. So at this point, there's really nothing that anyone can do. 
Right. This is one of the stick your head in the sand and cry a little if you're if you're in China. But, you know, a whole lot of people in China. <laughs> right. Not real happy right now. Yeah, exactly. So finally tonight, Padres at TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco. He talked to Andrew Chesesnock. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And I probably am not. He's from a company called Organic Motion. And he talked about their new motion capture, real-time virtual reality content creation studio. Uh, let's take a look at some of that video. Green screen capture has been a staple of traditional 2D broadcasting for well over a decade. But what if you could have the exact same effect with the exact same setup, but instead of 2D, you have 3D. That's why we're here at Organic Motion showing what their motion capture platform can do. I'm speaking with Andrew from Organic Motion, who's going to explain why this dev kit is something you may want to pick up. Andrew, where do you see this being used? I mean, it is, it's amazing technology, the ability to generate in real time a 3D model that I could use in broadcasting, but it seems to be a, a bit of a specialized product. Well, we're really excited. Uh, so we released uh, Reality Capture Live uh, here at the show uh, to really empower traditional media companies to make that jump from you know, 2D film into virtual reality. There's all this excitement with virtual reality. Wouldn't it be cool if you have a reality show and you're trying to drum up some traffic on your website to create some clips with your, uh, with your talent in VR? So you know, if you're used to doing green screen, well, then just uh, put people in a very similar system except they're being scanned in full 3D, you know, have two reality stars, have a fight, put that clip online, someone clicks on it, puts on their headset, and now they're standing there with the stars exploring and, and, and understanding spatially you know, what's going on. Well, Allison, are you excited about virtual reality or do you think uh, it's more hype at this point? You know, I thought it was all hype. And then I uh, got to play with a virtual reality headset with one of the, um, uh, ah, what's the name of it? One everybody knows about Oculus. Oculus. <laughs> The uh, the second generation dev kit and uh, a friend of mine had it and I played a game and I was I was just kind of wandering through someplace and his daughter bumped my hand from the outside of this environment and I screamed. <laughs> I mean, it was just because ah! I didn't know what it was because it wasn't in my world. It, it is it is absolutely freaky. And now uh, we went to a CES uh, event in L.A. where they had some virtual reality stuff and we played a game that was just so all encompassing. Uh, I am a little worried about what it's going to do to our brains, though, because my friend that has it said that when he plays it for too long, if he plays games for, say, a couple of hours, he comes out and he says that that like the plant is too three dimensional. It's, it's really freaky looking to him. And he, and he got me thinking about what do you what about our children? You know, if they live too much in that world, will they get all weird wiring from it? it, it it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I think it's real. I think this is going to going to have legs. Yeah, I, I definitely think. Yeah, my kids played with uh, it was called Noon. It was a new VR from Korea and they played with it for only like 10 minutes. And not only were they like constantly asking to play with it and had no interest in the real world at all. They also said that when <laughs> they stopped, they felt really dizzy and a little bit sick. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, the sickness thing is getting better with it. The graphics are getting better. It used to be really woozy, but it's getting better. Yeah, I do definitely. think it's the future. And I definitely think it's a lot of people were just saying, look, well, that's all hype. And then you put on the goggles and you're like, oh, the VR face. And then you just are super excited about it. But you have to experience it yourself, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, you can see more of from TechCrunch Disrupt. You can check out our live special. That will be online a little bit later tonight. Well, Allison, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us and staying for the whole show. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. This was fun. I, I love doing this kind of stuff. So Allison Sheridan, is uh, she's from Nozilla Cast, a Mac podcast at podfeet.com. And if you go to Podfeet, you'll see an, expl an excellent explanation of why strong, unique passwords still matter. Allison, tell us a little bit about who this video is for. Yeah, a lot of stuff is out there explaining in depth about encryption and hashing and SHA-256, you know, all that kind of stuff that just makes regular people go brain dead when you try to talk to them. I tried to make a video that would that would be simple enough that people would understand who aren't high-tech people. So this is for your neighbor, uh, you know, for your brother that doesn't listen to you and refuses to use a password manager. And it, it, I'm trying to make it simpler. It's only about six minutes long and it's got lots of pictures. And it's a, it's a little video that walks you through why they matter and, and how hacking actually happens. And, uh, and it's a little bit funny, a little bit, but uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's not meant for the high-tech person. It is very simplified. I don't pretend to think that this is exactly how encryption works, 
but it's close enough to get the idea across. And that's what I was searching for was a way to way to explain to normal people. I've been doing it at user groups lately and and they they care, but they didn't get it and they really like this explanation. So it's great if you need a little refresher course or if you want to forward it to someone in your life who needs a refresher course. <laughs> Thank you, Allison, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Take care. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash technewstonight. You can like us to get links to the show when it's posted. And we also post some of the stories we're going to talk about. And if you want to be part of the conversation, you can post a comment on the stories that we post. We'll read some of them right here on the show. Now, speaking of Facebook, when I hosted Tech News Today for Mike Elgin last week, we talked about the rumored Facebook dislike button. The button was intended to show empathy, not hatred for something, uh, which people could already do in the comments. But as we talked about, sometimes we just can't be bothered to comment on someone's post. And I said that was sad. And Matt wrote in, he said on Thursday, September 16th, Megan Maroney said that's kind of sad that we're so lazy that instead of commenting on a post, particularly in the event that the topic is not a happy one, we lazily just hit the like button. And he wanted to offer his perspective on that. He said, whether the post is happy or sad, I often purposely avoid commenting because the moment you do, you receive notifications for every other person's comment on that post. I just don't want the noise. Granted, I know I can manually turn off notifications for a particular post, and I often do, but currently it's just less bothersome to acknowledge a post with a like and know that you won't be inundated with notifications from the post. Thank you, Matt, for the comment. It was interesting. Uh, I, I do sometimes get annoyed by all of those posts, but I have been, after we did this story, I have been trying to comment more when someone has uh, posts something on Facebook that is sad or that I feel empathetic about because I was before just not doing anything. And uh, I feel like it's nice to acknowledge that you heard someone, especially when they're in pain. So you can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And of course, don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can subscribe to that too. I'm Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.